Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to talk about a typical element of uh, Ruben Östlund's films. Uh, the one uh, that even appears in uh, the title of his uh, 2008 movie. I'm very uh, nervous about the, my pronunciation. Uh, Dom of Ravilia, uh, which means uh, the involuntary in Swedish. Um, in his films, the unexpected twists and turns of everyday rituals, mostly of middle class people in modern Western society, always play a central role. Random events shed a, sh a strange light on the everyday lives of the characters and subvert the ideological surface of their conventional lives. An avalanche, a shipwreck or just a street robbery triggers reactions that make it impossible for the characters to look in the mirror after the event. Their unexpected behavior disrupts their own identity, which can no longer be fully restored. This idea of life as theatrical stage, where the show always de uh, devi uh, deviates uh, from the intentional direction, evokes the notion of deconstructed performativity. While J.L. Austin builds his speech act theory on the concept of successful performativity, assuming that by saying the right words, we are able to produce certain effects in the way we want them, Jacques Derrida points out that the effect, <coughs> effect of a speech act lies precisely in the conventionality of the ritual, the mechanical repetition of certain words, which means that a performative, performative act always already deviates from the speaker's intention. Austin's main example of the unsuccessful performative, the theatre actor quoting the, word of the words of the role, becomes the fundamental model in the deconstructive reading, and the whole speech act theory becomes a theory of structural parasitism, illustrating um, Derrida's ideas about unreadability, the constant possibility of misunderstanding. Judith Butler, who is interested in how social identity and gender in particular is created through the use of language, says that performativity always already precedes the subject. It is only the basic need for illusion that makes us believe that there is an agency behind our actions that we can perform successfully on the world stage. It is logical that performativity which precedes the subject cannot be represented in intentionally. It can only be elicited from a situation indirectly, only through the failures of intentional representation. We have to employ a kind of anamorphic technique, well known from Holbein's The Ambassadors, analyzed by Jacques Lacan in Four Fundamental Concepts, to make it appear on the threshold of our side. Uh, this is what happens in Östlund's film, in which the the construction of the controlling subject is always linked to a kind of representational confusion. Unusual settings which separate the visual and acoustic elements of a scene, for example by showing only the legs in a dialogue, or the distorted reflection of the characters, or a too distant view of a speaking subject, shifts the focus from the content of the dialogue to the situation itself. This unreflected ang angle provides an uncanny position, very similar to what Lacan calls the perspective of the gaze. In the case of uh, direct intermediality, this works by focusing on the use of the other medium, the creative process itself rather than the product. In play and the involuntary, the kids photograph each other with, with their smartphones and make videos with their laptops. The triangle of sadness opens with a scene of professional models being photographed for fashion magazines. In a recurring scene in the films, forced performances in public places evoke the medium of theatre. When, for example, the young bullies force a stranger to sing on a public bus, or when one of the kidnapped boys is forced to play the flute or do push-ups in play, the film gives sp space to theatrical scenes with a performer and an audience. But in each case, it is the behind-the-scenes situation that is important. Östlund is interested in how the kids become ad hoc directors or how a model takes up a steel position. Therefore, the primary media layer of his films, whatever art form he invokes, is a live performance, the involuntary performative theatre behind the intentional performance. Later, when intermediality becomes more decisive in Östlund's films, 
the tension between intentional and unintentional performance increases dramatically. As the analysis of this subject is always accompanied by serious moral issues and social dilemmas, the role of art and its social grounding inevitably becomes important. We move from smartphone cameras and spontaneous street performances through, prof through uh, professional magazine photography to the institutional uh, form of the museum. The protagonist of this square is the chief curator of a modern and contemporary art museum in Stockholm. The film gets its title from the artwork that is exhibited in front of the museum in the beginning of the film. We watch the process as it takes the place of a classic equestrian statue and follow the promotional plans the museum is making to attract high attendance. Throughout the film, we also see other exhibits at the museum, but all of them, like the square, serves only to divert attention, giving way to performative performances unfolding at the edge of the site. The film's memorable, awkward atmosphere comes from the fact that the work of art, with its explicit intent and creative concept, contrasts with the spontaneous action surrounding the exhibition process. When, for example, a cleaner accidentally vacuums a pile of sand in one of the installations, the artistic order clashes with the spontaneity of reality. The situation is made particularly ironic by the fact that this act identifies the art artwork with the garbage. From the perspective of performativity theory, it is significant that the main theme of the film, contemporary art, also focuses on accidentality. Following the avant-garde ideas of dissolving the boundary between uh, art and life, it wants to have a direct impact on life, to function as a political act instead of an ivory tower. As the characters in the film say, the museum is interested in the cutting the edge projects. Go back to square. Uh, the square is a good example of this as its immediate intention is to awaken social sensibility and act as a safe place for all who enter the space, regardless of race, class or gender. As the information sign says, the square is a sanctuary of trust and caring. Within its boundaries, we all share equal rights and obligations. In his opening speech, a Christian, the curator, is uh, uh, giving the following examples. If someone is hungry or grieving or grieving or needs to learn to swim, a passerby is obliged to stop and help the person. The film, is, uh, the film confronts this artistic project with images of real squares of street beggars. The fact that these natural squares appear to be completely ineffective questions the success of the political aim of the installation, the possible crossing between art and life. While with the walls of the museum, uh, within the walls of the museum, the high elite celebrates the utopian concept of this installation, people pass by the street beggars indifferently. Something similar happens to our curator, who, while talking about equality in the museum, remains blind to the social context of the robbery that happens to him outside the building. He wants revenge and drops threatening letters in the mailboxes of those who may have stolen his wallet. He arrives to the poor district with his Tesla of justice, as he calls his car, uh, which becomes an ironic allegory of upper class hypocrisy. Deeply immersed in this personal incident, we, he misses the marketing meetings of this square, which result in a YouTube video uh, with a message completely at odds with the original concept. To attract more viewers, the video features a little girl who explodes in the middle of the square. It is not only the works of art that miss the mark, but also everyday theatre diverts from the intended direction. Social rituals, such as a public interview, an important meeting, or the opening of an exhibition, are disrupted by random events. During the interview, we hear loud swearing from the audience, from a man with uh, Tourette's syndrome, who is not being sent away on the grounds of political correctness. Also in a call for Western tolerance, the crying of a baby brought in by a co-worker disrupts a marketing meeting. The scene of, of um, uh, Christian's failed opening speech is particularly awkward because we saw him 
practicing his speech in the toilet earlier, rehearsing the scene where he lets his emotions take over and interrupts his own speech. In front of the mirror, he rehearses how he will put his papers away, take off his glasses and start speaking from the heart. But when he gets this far in front of the audience, his well-prepared speech is interrupted by a phone ringing. The planned spontaneity interrupted by an unplanned coincidence equals the failure of the intended performativity of contemporary art. The layers of losing control begin with personal events, the street robbery where Christian literally loses his properties, continue with our public behavior, the interrupted interviews and speeches, and end with, end with the art form that fails to provide a, re, a reliable framework for keeping the intended meaning within the designated boundaries. And the ape man uh, performance, the uh, most important scene, scene uh, for me in the film. Uh, so it is a memorable 10 minute scene which brings these layers together. Oleg Rogozin, who previously appeared on the screen of a video installation, gives a live performance at an exclusive dinner for museum supporters. The show begins with <coughs> artificial lightning and a voiceover, then Rogozin, acting like a monkey, enters the room. And now I wish it were uh, to watch uh, just a little part of this scene. So Rogozin gets on the tables and starts to insult the guests, first in a funny way, uh, then becomes wilder and wilder, smashing a bottle and pulling the woman's hair. At the same time, the audience behavior changes. At first they are laughing in confusion, as is usual in interactive performances, balancing between the spectators and the participants' position. As the situation ex escalates, some guests leave the room, but those who stay accept the following as a work of art and refuse to intervene even when a woman is lying on the floor close to being raped. The bold heads express both the detachment of the spectator who maintains the boundary between art and life and the passive reaction to save life in the jungle described by the narrator. The film obviously links this uh, to the indifference of the passers-by passing the beggars seen earlier, creating the metaphor for modern society as a jungle. The political correctness, the idea of tolerance, turns out to be a lie as people are seen as animals selfishly protecting their own lives as Christian does in his struggle to get his wallet back. The indifference is finally broken at the last moment and the performance ends with the audience beating the performer. We cannot say whether this ending was intentional or not, but the violence of the man in tuxedos 
is certainly surprising, and we can assume that the performer did not want to be beaten to death. The performance is therefore a failure on all levels, personal, public, and artistic. In the same gesture, the film holds a mirror to the hypocrisy of exploitative art form and social conventions. It creates situations in which our conventional rituals derail. There are other layers that make this scene even more interesting. The char character's first name may be a reference to the Russian performer Ola Kulik, who became famous for his disturbing performances in which he acted like a wild dog. Uh, sorry, I, was, I wanted to step here. Okay, so this is uh, Ola Kulik, the Russian performer. Another pos uh, possible reference may be to the actor himself, Terry Notary, who regularly plays monkeys in Hollywood productions, such as King Kong and the Planet of the Apes uh, franchise, in which he also works as a stunt coordinator and a movement choreographer. By stepping out uh, from behind the illusory mirage of the CGI machine, but remaining in his usual role, he finds himself on the threshold of theatrical representation and performance. While his performance as Oleg Kulik, in the guise of Oleg Rogozin, closes the live performance in a representational frame, motion capture artist Terry Notary quasi-cameo appearance provides the actor's unique presence. This multi-layered layered displaced performance echoes the deconstructive idea of penetrated presence of difference. Uh, but what is the case with Östlund's own work of art? It seems uh, rather ironic that the film identifies itself with the installation it is so critical about. Does Östlund's film try to limit its own inter interpretation in the same way as the square? And does it become unsuccess unsuccessful in this effort? The answer has to be yes to both questions, since the film is constructed from the same material as its subject. Signifiers that play the game of difference, causing a tension between performativity and representation. The best example of how Östlund's films can be misunderstood is play, which has also been interpreted as racist and socially sensitive. There is a recurring situation in the square, square when somebody cries for help but receives no response. Sometimes the source remains hidden even to the film's viewer, the voice hanging in the air like a haunting, uncanny call. This fading sound can be seen as the final performative act of Östlund's film, with no illusion of reaching the goal, yet leaving us with a triggering feeling. Thank you. I hope it was in time. Thank you very much.